our schools, and I think this has been intensified by the establishment of academies, um, our schools are amongst the most autonomous and the most independent in the world. Now, at the same time, I think they're bound um, into a centralised system, a national system of accountability, which is also stronger than most places in the world. And I'm thinking here of the three pillars of, um, of tests and examination, uh, league tables, and Ofsted inspection. And while OECD studies do report high levels of school autonomy linked with, tight, with um, tight accountability can drive improvement. I've yet to find a single instance of a system being successful by using school autonomy and independence as the dominant drivers of improvement. Now, I've been chairing um, an academy, a commission looking at the development of academies and the development of academies into the future for the last six months. It, it's absolutely clear to me that successful schools, and in particular uh, head teachers in those schools, prize their independence and autonomy. But again, none of them would say that it was sufficient for improvement. And again, if I look to the OECD, I see that their research telling us that two conditions are really necessary for beneficial impact. One, leaders have to be focused on education and learning. This is far more rare, I think. Um, it's not almost anyway as common as you'd expect. And second, really good professional support is needed, and that includes a range of effective training, development, support, and so on. Now, we, we know the core ingredients for school improvement, and I won't rehearse them today. And if you look at something like um, Ofsted's study of schools achieving against the odds, uh, you'll find remarkable similarities. We don't need to reinvent them for other schools, but we do need to embed them and customise them within every school. So they under, underpin the experience of every child in that school. So rather than focus on autonomy and independence as the key elements of system reform, I'd argue we need a better balance between independence, interdependence, and even dependence. Now, today's build is the London Festival of Education, and it seems appropriate just to remind ourselves of the impact of London Challenge, which has been such a force, I think, in making uh, the system in London much better. Um, but it's an in interdependent system, I think, and one that uh, is better because of that. I think it's been really encouraging to look over the last few years and see the number of school leaders um, and more slowly but still increasingly teachers see system leadership as an essential part of their job. Now that term I think includes, encompasses a whole range of different uh, activities across schools and I believe it's this that offers the greatest potential for building greater capacity for improvement. Schools need other schools. There isn't time I think this afternoon, and it might be that it emerges in your questions, but to, to think about in detail the sort of lateral activity across schools that now is taking place. But it is increasing I think day by day. We're seeing leaders and teachers extending not only their professional accountabilities, but also their moral accountabilities to schools beyond their own. It's good, too, to see more and more leaders giving system support, especially in the role national leaders of education, local leaders of education, uh, more recently specialist leaders of education, and national leaders of governance. And, and people doing this work, particularly NLEs and LLEs, have found they haven't been able to support other schools properly without using the staff in their own schools to support. And even when, those are giving, when they're giving intensive support to other schools, um, people doing that, that uh, identify reciprocal benefits um, for their own schools. I think teaching school alliances are also an increasingly positive force for collaboration across independent schools. There's a whole series of active school-led partnerships emerging too. Challenge Partners, for example, is a collective of schools not only challenging each other to do better, but also supporting weaker schools to improve. Um, those schools pay a fee per child to, to join this collective. Um, and the, the collective activity provides, they describe it like this, as a source of professional aspiration for both leaders and teachers. And it's really interesting to see the way Challenge Partners uses peer review as a key way of raising aspiration and driving professional accountability. So if improvements to be as strong as we need it to be, schools need to be interdependent, they need to learn from each other. Um, and a rigorous 
focus on developing the skills of teaching, which I still would describe as the craft of teaching, has to be central to this collaboration. Um, a focus on skills-based practice has to be rooted, I think, in the evidence of classroom observation and the culture of peer learning. Um, I've seen numerous examples of schools finding the time for this, and, and it does require time, I think, for teachers to work together, uh, to reflect together on the detail of their teaching and the evidence of its impact on their learning. They're finding the time because they found this work across schools shifts deeply embedded practice, makes it better, uh, more quickly than anything else that they've used so far, and accelerates improvement and the progress of children in that school. So I'm not talking just about providing school-to-school -school support, important that though that, that is, but collaborative activity uh, to improve practice, and even in some instances, to create new and innovative practice. Um, I, I think David Hargreaves' model is, is a model that should inspire us all. It's a model of schools working in partnership to improve teaching and learning for them all. Um, he emphasizes a focus on mutual observation, on coaching, on learning by doing, uh, which not only shares good practice uh, and create, but also creates it. It's this approach, I think, that will create and generate uh, real and lasting change. Thank you very much. The MPQH, the National Professional Qualification for Headship, which is the qualification which uh, aspiring head teachers and school leaders take. And the uh, Institute takes it very seriously indeed. I don't know if they still do, but they did then. Uh, everyone turned up in their gowns and hoods. They treated it like a, a, a conventional graduation ceremony. I remember because I had to get my gowns sent down for my university and hoods and all that so I could give the uh, certificates away as if it was a a conventional graduation ceremony. What was that? But in fact, the MPQH, because we're very good in this country about creating traditions, which we think go back hundreds of years, in fact, started usually with the Victorians, but in this case, literally two or three years before. What they wanted to do, which was absolutely right, was to invest NPQH with all of the paraphernalia of a conventional graduate uh, degree ceremony. All of the uh, families came, all of the um, uh, those who had... Uh, I got the qualification, came to receive them with parchment, scrolls, and all of that. What was the purpose of it? It was to celebrate leadership training for taking over the management of schools. That's what it's about, which is precisely what Christine was talking about, that independence itself is only one of the attributes which a successful school will prize in terms of its management. It needs very good quality training. It needs excellent leadership. It needs to be inter interdependent, all of those things are important, and it's how you put them all together, and this is the big challenge that faces uh, school leaders and those responsible for the system, it's how you put them together that produces good schools. Independence itself is not an elixir which itself produces success. So my answer to the question, the exam question which we were given for this session is, is, is independence enough to produce good schools? Emphatically not. And uh, if you uh, look at uh, my book, which I'm told is in the bookstall, uh, downstairs, all good books. So there's actually Amazon, nine pounds and nine p. I don't know why the extra nine p is there, but anyway, uh, it, available there. You'll see that I have a long account of the development of the academy movement that makes it clear that it was never about independence alone. What academy is about, which of course, an, an academy is primarily the academy legal structure primarily addresses the governance of schools. There's a lot else that is important for a successful school too: curriculum, quality of teaching, and teachers, and so on. But the governance specifically, which is specifically the area that academy status addresses, what academies were intended to do, the academies I was responsible for, the sponsored academies, was not to make schools independent as the uh, reform that was going to produce transformation. It was to produce high-capacity governance, one of the features of which was real responsibility vested in those high-capacity governors by the state, which means real responsibility, meaning uh, autonomy, to be able to deliver the goals which were set out by the state in allowing uh, the academy to proceed. But it's high capacity governance that's the crucial thing. And by that, I mean governing agents and members of governing bodies, and in particular, those who are responsible for driving the governance of the school as an institution, setting its ethos, employing and, uh, and carrying out performance appraisal for 
um, the head teacher and the management team, all of those things which go to make good quality governance and which have traditionally been very weak in the English state school system, particularly in comprehensive schools in more challenging areas which have found it hard to recruit high quality governors and have tended to rely for their governance on local education bureaucracies which have been very variable in their quality. The, the breakthrough in the thinking of academies was to seek to invest school by school, high capacity, uh, the, the, the responsibility for managing those schools in high capacity governors who may be uh, educational trusts, it may be existing successful schools, the single biggest promoter of academies are existing successful schools, which have established trusts that now, uh, that now manage many schools. Yesterday I was on a platform in Manchester uh, with Sir Paul Edwards, who uh, is, is the chief executive of the Garforth Trust, Gar the, the, his trust grows out of what is the most successful school, state school by far in Leeds, Garforth, which has set up a trust. That trust now manages 40 schools and has had large numbers of converter academies that have been applying because they want to take part in and become uh, uh, a part of his, his trust and all of the, the, uh, uh, the governance resources and other resources it can bring to bear. When I was uh, responsible for developing the academy policy, I reflected a good deal on the grant maintained school policy. And people thought that there was a straight read across between the two, which is incorrect. There was no straight read across between the two. The lesson I drew from grant maintained schools is that simply vesting greater independence, and independence is relative, and I'll come back to that in a moment, vesting greater independence in existing governors of schools where those governing bodies are themselves weak is not a recipe for success. It is a recipe for reinforcing failure with failure. The grant maintained schools that were successful, and some of them were phenomenally successful, indeed a number of them have become uh, grown into the trusts which now sponsor uh, academies, were those that already had strong, high capacity governing bodies. Vesting greater autonomy in those managing agents did indeed liberate them and led them to generate greater success and now that they're allowed to do so, to take over the management of other schools and to leverage that success more widely. Where weak and failing schools went grant maintained, and quite a number did in the um, early to mid 1990s, they did not succeed. Indeed, a number of them became a good deal worse than they had been before. And the worst thing of all is that the then government, the then Conservative government allowed schools which were threatened with closure, which had run foul of Ofsted, allowed some schools in that category to grow grant maintained, and that was almost invariably a recipe for disaster. So the academy model in respect of underperforming schools, so the sponsored academies, was never about independence alone. It was about seeking to identify high capacity governors, vesting in them the responsibility for the governance of schools and giving them the tools for the job, one of the tools of which was the degree of autonomy necessary to, to take real charge of the management of the institution and to bring about success. However, even all of that isn't enough because governance is only one of the aspects, though it's a much underestimated aspect, and that's another breakthrough, I think, in the thinking of academies. It, it recognised the importance of governance, but it's only one aspect in the success of schools. Equally important are leadership, which Christine talked about, the quality of teachers and teaching, and the quality of teachers and the training of teachers is a big ongoing issue, continuous professional development and all that is important. However, there's a very big issue which faces us as a country in how we recruit more of the brightest and the best into teaching. I have a good deal to say about this in my book. The whole, there's a whole chapter which describes what I just call in a new deal for teachers and how we dramatically improve the attractiveness of the teaching profession to new graduates. We have in this country an average of two applicants, two, per teacher training place. That's a great deal better than the situation 15 years ago when for many subjects there weren't secondary subjects, including maths, physics, chemistry, IT, and in some parts of the country, even English. There weren't even enough applicants to fill the training places. But that too, still, if we're being analytical about it, makes teaching a state school teaching a barely selective profession. The best education systems in the world, Scandinavia, particularly Finland, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, the leading parts of China, they have between 10 and 20 applicants for each teacher training place. And the difference between two and 10 and 20 is a transformational difference in terms of the quality of teachers who are able to put before classes. We need a massive upgrading of the quality of our recruitment and training of teachers in order to attract far more of the most able graduates 
into the profession. We also need to improve the curriculum. Uh, the Secretary of State was speaking earlier today, and he's invested a huge amount of energy in replacing the GCSE with, so far as I can see, an exam that's going to look very similar to the GCSE. Well, Tim Brinkhouse, who was also speaking this morning, always cautioned me when I was a minister against time and energy traps. That is, big initiatives which consume huge amounts of energy and lead to changes which aren't much different to what went before, which is precisely what it seems to me the government is doing with the GCSE. I'm open-minded about whether there should be one exam board per subject, whether you should or shouldn't have modules, though you don't need a massive reform of the GCSE to bring about either of those two reforms. But neither of those reforms, or any of the others, which are on the table with the uh, Secretary of State's proposed EBAC, are, to my mind, going for what is the big central issue in terms of curriculum in English education today. The big central issue, to my mind, is what happens after the age of 16, not what happens before, and in particular, what happens after the age of 16 for the half of the cohort who are not on track to go to university, who are desperately shortchanged by the current system, have no proper pathway through the education system at all, who we need to dramatically improve our regime for as the education participation age is raised to 18 from 2015, and that means a revolution in technical education. It means a, uh, a, a, a complete recasting of the way that schools and colleges uh, teach and provide uh, for, um, uh, for 16 to 18 year olds, and it means big improvements in curriculum and assessment for them, including the Alison Wolfe report two years ago, which uh, which uh, I found shocking in its analysis. One statistic, just to give you one statistic that I found particularly shocking, of those who do not get GCSE, English and Maths, grade C or above, at the age of 16, which is 40% of the cohort, indeed it's more than that this year, of those who do not, only 4%, 4% go on to reach that standard by the age of 19, which is a catastrophic failure in the curriculum and the teaching available to a large part of the cohort beyond the age of 16, we've got to put that right. But the other crucial thing which we've got to get right as a country is, is the uh, destinations that young people go on to. Part of the reason why for the 50% going on to university, the curriculum works reasonably well and standards are reasonably high, though in my view the post-16 curriculum even for them is, is too narrow and is still rooted in uh, a generation out-of-date view of, uh, of, of, uh, of how 16 to 18 year olds uh, should study, but the reason why it by and large works for them is that the destination they have to go on is regarded as worthwhile by them, it's universities, it's highly motivating for the young people themselves and for their teachers and their parents. They're all at the moment filling in their UCAS forms, they see this as a hugely worthwhile thing to do, and therefore there is this perception in the education system of a through train through from secondary school, GCSE, A-level, university. We do not have an equivalent for the 50% who are not on track to go to university. There are not enough apprenticeships. There's a chronic shortage of, of good quality work and train routes, and that is massively uh, demotivating for 16-year-olds um, uh, who are not on a university track, and it needs to be sorted. And if I had influence over um, policy in the future and was sitting in a government department wanting to do the next big thing after academies, the next big thing in my view, what I would be devoting my energies to, in the same way as I did to academies over uh, uh, many of the years I was in government, would be the, reinvent the reinvention of apprenticeships. We need to have as many good quality, not just a lot of the stuff that's called apprenticeships at the moment, but really good quality apprenticeships at level two and level three for 17, 18 and 19 year olds, and of course 18 and 19 year olds after 18. Uh, so after 2015 when the education participation age is raised, so that we have as many good quality apprenticeships as we have university places. We have all of the leading organisations in the country, including public sector organisations, which are by and large lamentable at the moment at offering apprenticeships, offering them. We need a UCAS equivalent system for apprenticeships so that we have uh, real prestige and established pathways right through to apprenticeships. And if we can get that right as a country, and I see it as a massive job of reform that's necessary, then we will be serving the 50% who do not go to university as well as the 50% who do. We will transform standards and expectations for those young people who at the moment are poorly served. Their parents, the young people themselves, their teachers will have worthwhile goals to aim at in the way they simply don't 
too, for too much of the time at the moment, and we will have sorted out what, to my mind, is one of the is has been one of the um, chronic weaknesses, if not the Achilles heel of the English education system since those first reports started being published back in the 1850s, comparing unfavourably English technical education with technical education on the continent, and in particular in Germany. So, independence alone is not enough. We need high capacity governance school by school. We need to continue the progress that we've made in the last 15 years on improving leadership. We need a revolution in the quality and quantity of, of, uh, of, of young people and career switchers later coming forward uh, to teach in our schools. We need steadily to improve the curriculum that's on offer, and we need a revolution in the creation of apprenticeships so that the 50% who don't go to university are as well served and have opportunities and pathways which are as motivating for them as those who currently go into university. If we get all of that right, then we'll have a decent education system in this country. Thanks very much.